Hello everyone, and welcome to the problem solving for April 7th. Here we're looking at the idea that when a hot object comes into contact with a cold object, what's going to happen is heat transfers from the hot object to the cold object until they achieve the same temperature. No different than if you try and take a bath and the bathtub full of water is too hot, you add a little cold water in and by doing so, you take the hot water temperature down. Meanwhile, the cold water temperature has to come up and how much that temperature changes depends on the amount of heat transferred, which depends on the amounts of substances and their heat capacities. Now this all ties together through the idea that, of course, once we define the system as something interesting, the part of the world that we're really interested in, and the surroundings as everything else, whatever happens to the system, the equal but opposite thing has to happen to the surroundings. If you stand in front of a fireplace, the heat coming off the fireplace is given to you to raise your temperature. So the fireplace could be considered the system in that case, and the surroundings would be you. This can really be encapsulated right here in this particular equation. We haven't really defined what the system and what the surroundings is. It doesn't really matter. As long as we realize that one thing that's undergoing a change is interesting and one is the kind of opposite side of that, then we see the importance of this negative sign here. That's the equal but opposite part of what I mean. To solve this problem, we're going to need the heat capacity data. I got this from slide 26, table 6.4. We see the heat capacity data for copper and water from that table. And I've just kind of really encapsulated all my other data, the initial temperature of copper and water and the masses of copper and water. So where this comes for us is this idea that, of course, the negative Q involved for the water, let's say, is going to have to equal the amount of heat for the copper. Again, it's a transfer of energy from one to the other. The amount of energy transferred, of course, has to be the same. We can change this into the mass of water times the heat capacity for water and the change in temperature for water. That's no different than what we would have seen in the last video, connecting heat to a heat capacity and an amount and a temperature change. And, of course, we've got to remember that negative sign in there. And then we're going to do the same thing here for copper on this side. Now, we would have seen that temperature changes are always final temperature minus initial temperature. So let's just take a look at what we've got here. So this will be the mass of water, heat capacity for water. And you'll notice I'm being very detailed um, in this particular case because um, since I'm using same types of data, I want to make sure I am associating everything in the right place. So here we see that I've changed the temperature change for water to some final temperature of what we're being asked to find in the problem and the initial temperature of water. And of course, this can be, and maybe I'll change colors now to really help simplify things a little bit. Uh, and here we go. And really, at the end of the day, uh, there's that idea. If I put hot water and cold water into the bathtub, at some point they're going to reach the same final temperature in that particular case. And that's what we're being asked to solve. So let me just rearrange this a little bit so we can perhaps simplify what's on the go a little bit. So what I might do is here, let's take the negative mass of water and maybe divide it by the mass of copper. There's a method to my madness when I do this, because uh, it's going to help me talk about a few things. I'm going to take my heat capacity of water and divide it by the heat capacity, or sorry, the mass of copper. Uh, and then what I might do is just keep Tf minus uh, Ti water on this side, and then on the other side, let's just do this for now. Tf uh, minus Ti for copper. So now we can start plugging in some numbers. This is going to be minus 100.0 grams divided by 50.0 grams. Those would have been the masses that we saw. The heat capacity for water is 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. Uh, and here we have the, oops, 
that are, I turn that to the actual heat capacity it's supposed to represent it. And I thought, what, that's 0.385? Let's take a quick look. Yes, 0.385 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And then, of course, we can still leave the TF minus R. Uh, 26.5 degrees Celsius, I believe, is the initial temperature of water. And, yep, yeah, hope this is going to equal our TF minus 100.0 degrees Celsius. Now, the reason I've done it this way is, first things first, we're going to see the mass units cancel out in both cases, and all those heat capacity units cancel out in both cases. But what we've done is break things apart into a couple of ratios to really give us a sense of what's on the go. The first ratio is effectively minus 2.00. We've got twice as much water as we have uh, um, copper. Turns out I've got those numbers backwards, so let's just fix that. It was going to be 50.0 grams of water and 100.0 grams of copper, which means, of course, this math I've just done is not right. That is actually going to be minus 0 0.500 for the ratio. We've got twice as much water, sorry, twice as much copper as water. Um, we can now then look at the heat capacity ratio, compare those, and effectively what we see is it's going to take a whole lot more energy to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius than it does for copper. That's again the idea that the heat capacity of water is 4.184 divided by the 0.385 for copper. What we find is the heat capacity of water is 10. 0.8 sub 7 times bigger. I would have to put 10, almost 11 times more heat into a given amount of water to raise its temperature by the same amount as the same amount of copper. Uh, and so that's going to really work out for us in the long run. So let's keep these as uh, grouped ratios. And again, we've got our final bits here, TF minus 26.5 degrees Celsius, and all of this is going to equal TF minus 100 degrees Celsius on this other side. Let's multiply those ratios together. Our minus 0.5 times our 10.87, and what we find is that we have in this case, maybe I'll take it to a different color. Let's go with a nice green. Um, minus 5.435. So, there are two pieces, two connections. There's the difference in heat capacity, which will affect the amount of heat that needs to be transferred to accomplish the same kind of temperature change. And then there's the masses. So when we combine the two ratios together, the mass ratio and the heat capacity ratio, what we see is the amount of water we have will require about five and a half times more heat to change its temperature by one degree than the copper would require for the same amount of copper for a one degree change. Uh, this we're going to multiply by Tf minus 26.5 degrees Celsius, and that's going to equal Tf minus 100.0 degrees Celsius. Multiply through a little bit, we're going to get minus 5.435 Tf. The two negative signs in minus 5.435 and minus 26.5 will become a positive in that particular case. So that's going to take us to times 26.5, 144.0. 144.0, and let's be careful, we still have units there, so we got to keep those degrees Celsius. And that's going to equal Tf minus 100.0 degrees Celsius. And what I'm going to do is maybe I will bring my terms with Tf over to the right hand side and my terms involving degrees Celsius over to the left hand side. When I do that, I am going to get, let me just check my numbers, uh, yep, I'm going to get 244.0 degrees Celsius will equal 
Uh, and we've got one TF on the right hand side. We're going to add 5.435 TF to both sides, so that's going to kill us. Uh, 6.435 TF here, which means our final temperature should be something like 244.0 degrees Celsius divided by 6.453, and that gives us a final temperature of uh, 244 divided by 6.453. And we get 37.8 degrees Celsius. And if we wanted to convert that to Kelvin, we certainly could, but there's no need to do that. Uh, because here we go. Some good rules of thumb about this. That final temperature must be between Ti for water and TI for copper, and that's because, of course, um, I can't put some cold water into a hot bathtub and somehow get the final temperature colder than the cold water itself is, or I can't get the final temperature hotter than the hot temperature was. So if you get a temperature outside of that range, a final temperature outside of that range, the first thing to check is you move probably miss that negative sign in the equation. That's very important. If you miss the negative sign right here, that's going to lead to a temperature outside of that range. Obviously, making sure that you're keeping track that the data is going in the right place is going to be important, but that's the main thing uh, with a lot of thermochemistry problems. You can find it very easy to get the signs backwards and therefore very easy to get the final answer uh, incorrect. So that's today's problem solving uh, for April 7th. The Master in Chemistry assignment will be something very, very similar for this. So work on that when you get a chance. Have a good one, everyone, and I'll see you soon.